Joe's one of my heroes, Joe and Melinda. Uh, you know, you only run into a handful of people that are, have so much integrity and have given them their lives in such passion. So I just honor you guys, Joe. It's a, always an honor to be here. Uh, I just had a few things to share. I felt like the Lord was highlighting this week. One of them I heard a couple years ago, and uh, this was by, a, I can't remember who it was, but I know it was somebody I respected, otherwise I wouldn't have listened to it. But he was sharing on uh, the context of 2 Samuel chapter 11. And 2 Samuel 11, the first verse starts out with, uh, in the springtime when the kings would go to war, uh, David sent Joab and, he, and the rest of the Israelites to defeat Am- Ammon. And uh, they had a great victory, but it says David stayed back. And um, so in the time when kings go to war, David uh, stayed home. And what stuck out to me and what struck my heart was a phrase, and it was uh, when the, how did it go now? (laughs) In the times when, uh, in the things that we are uh, born to fight for, and we don't fight for the things we're born for, then there's conflicts arise that we're not, we don't have grace for. And it, it stayed with me because I felt like, you know, how does this relate to the times we live in with the coronavirus? For me, there's been so many great promises over America. I know Joe and Melinda and the Shekinah, with, with all the prophets you've had here, you know, we've heard for years Bob Jones saying a billion soul harvest. We've heard great awakening is in the land. You know, we're right on the verge of a great awakening. Where my heart uh, beats is for to see manifest sons rise up. You know, if we're going to have a billion soul harvest, my heart says, let's have 10,000 or 100,000 or a million manifest sons. Ones that I, I believe this is, the, the, this is what I was born to fight for. And during a time like this, you know, I, I was thinking about this in relation to Jesus in Luke 3. His father gives him this incredible blessing. He says to his son, you are my we are son. You are my mature son in whom I'm well pleased. And then the next thing is we see him sending uh, Jesus into the wilderness, the Holy Spirit leading him into the wilderness to this great conflict, this great contradiction. And so we start to see that whenever there's a great promise, like a billion soul harvest, like a, a, a great, third great awakening in America, there's going to be a contradiction and, and a, a, a conflict. And I think part of the conflict that we're seeing right now is this coronavirus. We're seeing something... It come, and one thing the Lord, I know what the Lord wants to do for sure, one of the things, I don't know all that Joe knows, <laughs> but I know a few things. One of the things he wants to do from the beginning, from the beginning of time is to have his eternal purpose uh, fill the earth. And his eternal purpose, the way I've defined it pretty simply, is God in Christ, uh, God glorifying himself in Christ, uh, Christ in man, and, and uh how does it go? Planted, formed, and expressed in man. Christ planted, formed, and, and manifest in us. And he wants to manifest his life in us during these times. And I, I was struck with, uh, today I, was watch, I wasn't watching, I was reading my iPhone, and the news came up, and there was a senator in one of the uh, cities, and they had a governmental meeting in their, in their governmental building, whatever it was, and there was two senators. One came, and he had a fever. He didn't know, he, he thought it was getting better. And he wasn't. He was tested positive for the coronavirus. They were both on the same political party. But the one guy just went off on this guy, uh, ranting on how angry he was, and disturbed he was that this guy would come to the meeting. And I was thinking to myself, you know, in this time in which we live, it's easy for the Lord to identify root issues in our heart. You know, I'm thinking, this guy is just so filled with anger simply because a guy that was infected with coronavirus came to a meeting. And he didn't intentionally do so, but I was thinking to myself, you know, what is God doing in your life and in my life during this, you know, there's there's a dream I had this week, and I think it relates to the season in which we live. It was just a couple nights ago, and we were building a dome over America, and we were using these cloth strips like you would do if you broke your bone. I don't know if they still do it. When I was growing up, I broke several bones, and, you know, they would wrap the cloth around, then it would dry into a cast. We were doing this over America and uh, it, the dome had almost finished, and then I said to whoever w- was putting the last uh, strips on the, on the cast, on the dome, I said to him, you know, we have to allow light to come in. We have to allow some light to penetrate, because it's, it's going to be totally darkness on the inside. It was very dark under the cast, 
And uh, I remember at the end of the dream, there's about 100 people that signed this, this cast over the country, and I only can remember two. One was uh, Derek Prince, and one was Charles Price, and they signed it, and maybe 100 other people were signing this thing. And then I wake up, and, uh, you know, I, I don't always understand the fullness of my dreams, but I've learned to trust them over 40 years. You know, I've, we've, we've gotten dreams, and we've waited on them, some of them are shelf, but we're, we know when we're hearing the Lord a little bit. I think that... I think that we're, there's a darkness over America, and uh, we were actually helping to put that dome there of darkness. The, Lord, the rays of the Lord's light is going to shine into that darkness, but it's a time, you know, there's uh, several passages, uh, Psalm 97, 1 Kings 8, I think uh, Deuteronomy 5, it talks about the Lord comes in, in uh, thick clouds or darkness. He, he, he shrouds himself in darkness. And I think in those times of darkness, you know, what does the cast do? It, 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 it covers brokenness. And we're, you know, the body of Christ in America is broken. The government is broken. There needs to be realignment. There needs to be some things taken out of our heart. And one of the things the Lord is showing me during this time is that, Chris, I'm giving you an opportunity. What's arising in our heart, you know? I know a, a week ago I shared a dream I had, and I'll just share the part of it. But in the dream, the Lord invited me into the inner sanctuary of a library in heaven, and it was all the scrolls of saints that had gone before me, and there were, their prayers were still active, alive. There was fire shooting out, smoke of incense. It was just the most amazing room. And I started weeping in the dream, and I backed myself out into the second room instead of being in the third room because I felt unworthy. And uh, at, when I woke up that morning, I was asking the Lord, uh, about the dream, and he says, Chris, you still have pockets of unworthiness in your heart, and I want to get rid of them. And I'm thinking about the coronavirus. How many of us have fear in our hearts, unbelief in our hearts? You know, I'm afraid I'm going to get sick. I'm going to better stockpile enough food for, you know, six months or whatever it is. And the Lord is identifying things in our hearts. I think it's a, a great invitation for us to find those pockets of, uh, of selfishness. You know, you're racing to the to the, you know, to, to the, get the right food, the meat or whatever it is, the toilet paper nowadays. I'm thinking if you don't eat, you're not going to need the toilet paper. But um, anyways, people are just selfish, you know, getting in the way of other people. I'm thinking, God, you're really identifying, you know, uh, what's in our hearts. In, in 1 Corinthians 11, it talks about many are weak and sick among you because you haven't uh, discerned the Lord's body. I know there's several applications to that, and I believe that there's several, several truths, one of them being the Lord's body. We haven't discerned the Lord's body in Isaiah 53, and so we don't know what the full provision is for our healing, so many are weak and sick. I know that's one level for sure, but I also think there's a literal level it, we haven't discerned the Lord's body in one another, and so many of us are weak and sick. We haven't, we haven't seen each other uh, the way God's asking us. The body of Christ, you know, we're, there's too much fighting, there's too much uh, jealousy and confusion, and you know, there's this verse that we looked at a little bit, and I wanted to touch on it a little more. But it's uh, the great Shema, it's Deuteronomy six. It's the prayer that Israel prayed before the morning and evening sacrifice. They prayed this prayer, and. Um, you know, it, before, as the lamb was being uh, slain the morning and evening, it, it was fulfilled in Christ being our evening sacrifice. But one of the things that was, that was in this prayer, the first part of the prayer is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord, he is one. And that word one means, it's a Hebrew word, akad, which means a many-membered one. It's a, it's a compound one. It, it, what God is saying is, look, Israel, you're in the I am of God. You're placed in me. We are the spiritual Israel. We're placed into Christ. It's interesting in Matthew, Mark 12, when they, the scribes ask Jesus, they say to Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And he's to, he starts coding. He doesn't start coding with love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He starts with hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Because what he's saying is he's saying this, this many member, this compound one, if you don't understand your oneness in Christ, you'll never be able to fulfill the love that's found in loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, or loving your neighbor as yourself. If we don't know our oneness in him, we're not going to see our neighbor as part of, one, uh, part of who we are in the body of Christ. And I think these are some of the things that the Lord is really identifying. And I think in, in many ways, it's a great gift for us to to have something cover, the, blanket the whole earth, and then uh, reveal dark pockets in our heart that need to be uh, given over to the Lord. You know, Isaiah 16, 
In mercy thy throne is established. In truth he will sit upon it in the tabernacle of David, uh, doing justice, seeking judgment, hastening righteousness. In, in mercy, this throne is established, but in truth, he sits upon it. He wants, he, you know, Ezekiel 8 says uh, there's a seat that uh, provokes to jealousy, there, the seat of jealousy that provokes to jealousy. There's a seat in our heart that's, that Jesus himself alone wants to occupy. He doesn't want, he, 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 you can't have faith and unbelief in the same place, faith and fear. You can't have anger, the human anger, and love in that same place. And God is jealous for the fullness of our heart. The, he, he wants to sit upon it in truth. He wants to sit upon it uh, solely. He doesn't want to share it with the enemy who, uh, you know, lies to us and we're embracing lies. And so we, we have the uh, enemy's uh, unbelieving, lying spirit. And part of that, you know, there's a couple of things that cause us to be ineffective, I think, the enemy's attacks. The second Adam's attack that he made on Christ in the wilderness was, you know, the first thing he says, if you're the son of God, make these stones bread. The first, uh, uh, you know, attack, the first, the first um, temptation was not to turn the stones to bread, but it was, if you be the son of God, that's always going to be the attack on the body of Christ. If you're one with Christ, you know, if you're the body of Christ, if you're, if you know, you, you know, you're, you're separate, you're not one with him. And that's, that, uh, uh, identity needs to be established in us. The first Adam's attack was on Revelation. It was, did God say to you, he's going to attack us. Did we hear the Lord? Uh, and do we know what our identity is? But if we can answer those two questions, then we can come into any of these. You know, I, I know Joe believes the same as I do, and, and many others do as well, but this is just the first uh, of many plagues, you know, the, uh, many difficult times coming. I think it's a test run for us to see how are we going to respond? How am I going to respond? Is there going to be fear in my heart? Am I going to, uh, you know, am I going to serve other people? Am I going to serve myself? Just think about myself, put a, put a hedge around my family and, and be good with it? Or am I going to say, God, what can we do to see your kingdom established? Because God is looking for the eternal purpose. The judgments of God, you know, they, they uh, release the righteousness in the land. They, they, the, the many learn righteousness. Righteousness. We learn righteousness because he's identifying things in our heart that are unrighteous. And he's saying, Chris, this is, a, this is good for you. I want to root out the things in your heart that aren't in, in, in alignment. I'm putting a, in a sense, I'm putting a, a cast, I'm putting a covering over the country. And it's darkness under the cast. I'm shrouding myself in darkness in a way because I want to reveal some things to you in darkness. And he'll penetrate those with rays of light. But, you know, why did Derek Prince sign the cast? I think Derek Prince signed it because when I think of Derek Prince, I think of, you know, a lot of things, but I think of uh, his prayer and fasting. It's a season where God's really called us the prayer side of things, intimacy, communion, intercession, with fasting, putting away the flesh, putting down the things that are, you know, uh, uh, warring against the spirit of, of life. And so we're in that invitation. Why Charles Price? Why are the, the only two guys I remembered? Because Charles, when I think of Charles, I think of faith. He's the one who had the most incredible revelation on faith. And we're living in a time where God is looking, you know, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find faith in the midst of a coronavirus? Or is he going to find fear? Are we going to be scared? Are we just going to say, no, Lord, I, I refuse. You know, Joe and I were talking yesterday on the phone. You know, there's, uh, you can resist the devil, but if you don't follow the submit to God, we're missing the whole, the whole point. We submit to God. We submit to, you know, who he is in us, who he is in the fullness of his nature. And we're saying yes to that. And in doing so, then we can, you know, plead the blood over our households. We, there is an aspect where we don't have to fear and we have power over these things. You know, whether it's a judgment from God or whether it's a, you know, whether the enemy's coming in like a flood or whether the Lord just lifts his hand and the enemy comes through uh, it, through that door because of, the Lord wants to expose. You know, he, the Lord is not, uh, he, he's, he's in a season, I think, of jealousy. He's jealousy for the throne of the body of Christ's heart. And he's not going to let us occupy it with a, another. And, and I think this is one of the main things God's doing. I know in my heart, it's like, Lord, show me every pocket during this time when everyone else is... Uh, is afraid. I want to walk in the shalom of God. You know, the the in Matthew it's talking about you that are you that labor and heavy laden, come unto me and I'll give you rest. And then he goes on and he says, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
And that word easy is the same word used in uh, Romans 2, 4. It's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. My yoke is goodness and my burden is light. There's a goodness about what the Lord is doing. If we would come to him, we would join ourselves to his yoke, which means oneness. We're coming into oneness with him, and we're receiving the goodness. All that he's given to us in our time of need, he will he'll supply that. So that's really what I wanted to share today, Joe. I know you've got a lot to, to share. So. That was awesome. Are we, is this on? This is, uh, I like having Chris here. And I like hearing his perspective. And it's really good. And uh, I, I want to, what I'm saying is just going to go right along with it. I want to talk about, uh, uh, there's a lot of people uh, weighing in on the coronavirus. Everybody has their opinion. Some it's from the devil. Some it's, from the Lord, and some we're going to handle it this way, or we're going to handle it that way. But uh, let's look at some some things through the lens of the Word of God. Is it from God? Is it from the devil? What do we do about it? How's it? What's our response? I love. Thank you, Chris, for what you're sharing. I think that's. I'm a hundred percent agreement. What God's primary goal is for our lives, His primary goal is to see us conform to the image of Christ. Abiding in Him and manifesting Him. That's, the, that's his, his biggest project. We know that it says in Romans chapter 8, God causes all things. All, if you look it up in the Greek, it means all. All, everything to work together for good to those that love God, to those that are called according to His purpose. And then the next verse says what His purpose is. For whom He called, He predestined to be conformed to the, to the image of his son. So everything, good, bad, and ugly, works together for this purpose, to conform us to the image of Christ. The highest good that could ever happen to any of us is that God, by his spirit, by his word, by his dealings, even, even sometimes chastenings, would move us from living in the flesh or the soulish realm into knowing, abiding, and manifesting Christ. The greatest good is for God to bring us into that place where we're abiding in Christ and, and being manifested sons and daughters. So to, with that's his highest goal. It's a lesser goal for God for us to all be comfortable. His, his highest goal is not my flesh. His highest goal is not how my soul feels. His highest purpose for our life in this brief time, is to conform us to Christ. So God is, is above all, and um, he's working everything for that good. And of course, God is, is good. He's not just always got us in school, always taskmaster, always dealing with conform. He gives us breaks. He gives us blessings. He gives us all good things to enjoy. But in the big picture, that's what he's after. And... Um, so let's look at this. Is this virus from the devil? If, now, if we look at it that way, it's from the devil, then we're just going to stand up and bind it because we have authority. Yeah, or is it from God or is, what is it? And here's what the Bible says. Now, if someone asks me, is it from the God or from the devil? I say, yes, it is. Let me explain. In 2 Samuel, now the book of Samuel and the book of Chronicles tell the same incident recorded twice. 2 Samuel uh, chapter 24, the Bible says the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. He moved David against them saying, go number Israel and Judah. Now who moved David to number Israel? I'll read it again. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel. He moved David against them saying, go number Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, anyway, David numbered them. After he did, the Bible says his heart troubled him. And he said, God, I've sinned. And then God judged him for doing it. So God had a contention. There was some, something in David's heart of relying on how many they had in their army. How great Israel was instead of on the Lord. God had a contention with Israel. And so he brought it out. He, he wanted it to manifest. 
in David's heart so he could deal with it. Now, if you see the same incident, just same thing we're saying, Chris, the same incident in 1 Chronicles 21 is telling the same thing. It says, now Satan stood up against Israel and he moved David to number Israel. Now, 2 Samuel 24 says, the Lord moved David to number Israel. 1 Chronicles 21 says, Satan moved David to number Israel. Is the Bible contradicting itself? No. All we have to do is look at the book of Job. When Satan wanted to attack Job, he couldn't because God had a hedge. That's what he, his complaint against the Lord. You have a hedge. God said, but God was boasting on his integrity. He said, I'll let you touch him, but this is how far you can go and no more. So Satan is on a leash. He, he can't just freely do whatever he wants uh, without any limits. There's restrictions. And so uh, all the Lord has to do is lift his hand. Satan's like a frothing rabid dog. He's full of hate. He would kill all of us right now if he could. But he can't. He can't just release deadly plagues all over the world at his will. If, if Satan had that much power, he'd kill all of us right now. He's limited. So here the, all the Lord has to do is lift his hand or take the hedge and, and let Satan provoke David to number Israel. And the Bible says it was the Lord doing it. It was the Lord that provoked David. And the way he did it was he let Satan do it. So we see the same thing when the, Satan attacked Job. Now, I, I know the word of faith angle on it. I've heard it from people say that uh, Job sinned with his mouth and because he said, the thing I greatly feared come upon me. And that's why it all came. But the Bible says the opposite. When Job's troubles came, he said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The next verse says, in all this, Job did not sin with his mouth. So he was telling the truth. God said, no, Job didn't miss it. Uh, and so... Even in the New Testament, Satan had to get permission from Jesus before he could sift Peter. Jesus said to Peter, Satan has asked to sift you. And what's implied in the context is the Lord said, and I gave him permission. It doesn't say that in the text, but that's what's implied. Because Jesus said, I've prayed for you so that your faith won't fail. Now, why did God allow Satan to sift Peter? Uh, we're not told directly, but it's probable that because Peter was boasting, when Jesus said he was going to be turned over and crucified, Peter said, if everyone forsakes you, I won't. If everybody else leaves you, I won't. I'll go to death with you. And that self-reliant pride needed to be dealt with. So I think in the love of God, knowing it's for his good, the Lord said, I'm going to let Satan sift you, but I've also prayed for you. that Your faith won't fail. In other words, this is not going to be unto death. It's going to, the devil is measured in what he can do to you, Peter. I'm going to allow it this far, and it's going to sift you, bring out something in you that needs to be purified. So there's God. So the devil is serving the Lord. Now, I'm, don't take that to an extreme and say that we're now case Sarah Sarah and let every demonic thing happen. No, there's a place we use the discernment of the Holy Spirit to stand against the enemy. But, but what we do is we submit to God, then resist him. So we find things going on. Now, I, one of the reasons that we, we need to understand, is it from God? Is it from the devil? Let's make this very clear. Ultimately, it is God's will for everybody to be healed. That's his ultimate will. And uh, if it doesn't happen in this life, for some people, it doesn't happen in this life. They're going to be totally whole in heaven. See, I mean, God's ultimate will is for our good. But along the way, if difficulties on the outer man help serve to bring our inner man into Christ, then those lesser pains serve a higher good. And so uh, one of the reasons I'm, I'm saying this is I read this. This is a little troubling to me. This is from a, a well-known minister. And in his email that came out a couple days ago, he said, 
And by the way, this is a person that I love and esteem, and um, he's a good person, but I don't agree with this, and it needs to be addressed. He said, today, on your prophetic journey, we're going to talk about the coronavirus, plagues, and other natural disasters, and how we should respond to them. These occurrences are not judgments from God. Jesus took all judgments and cursing when he went to the cross. Coronavirus is not a judgment from God, all right? Is that biblical? It's not biblical in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Uh, here's what 2 Chronicles 7, 13 says. When I shut up the heavens so that there's no rain. Now, we just saw... Australia go through a severe drought while they were having the worst fires in history in, in a long time. There was no rain. It, it, I know people in, in Australia, people that were writing and commenting, it, it served to bring multitudes and multitudes out to a place of crying out and praying to God. He said, when I shut up the heavens so there's so, no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, now, if you're not aware of it, you can read in the news right now in Ethiopia and Kenya, they're struggling to, to maintain a locust outbreak that's of biblical proportion. The United Nations is now calling for help because they're eating so many of the crops, it could lead to starvation. So there's a, there's a plague of locusts in Africa, and they said if some kind of intervention isn't done, it could multiply. They're multiplying so fast they could, it could multiply 500 times in size by June. So there's a locust plague. And then we got the co coronavirus. So just recently, drought and, and fires in Australia, coronavirus around the world, locust plague in Africa and spreading into the Middle East. Here's what God says. When I shut up the heavens so that there's no rain, or I command locusts to devour the land, or I send a plague, that's a virus, among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, will heal their land. So that's what God says about it. it to say that uh, locust plagues or natural disasters or these kind of things are never uh, from God as a judgment is just not biblical. And now one of the ways that we... Uh, let me just read a couple more verses, Okay. Uh, one of the ways that we get there, I'll tell you how we get there. Where's the verses I wrote? Just some scripture in case anybody's doubting. Habakkuk 3, verse 3 through 6. God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and His praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from His hand where His power was hidden. Plague went before him and pestilence. One translation says fever followed at his steps. He stood and the earth shook. He looked and made the nations tremble. So here the Bible says plagues go before him and fevers behind him. That's the Lord. Now Hosea 6 verse 1 and 2. Come, let us return to the Lord. For he has torn, but he will heal us. He's stricken, but he will bind us up. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Now see that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Nor is there any who can deliver from my hand. Now God's ultimate purpose is not to, he takes no pleasure in, he doesn't want to release pain or inflict unnecessary difficulties on us. But if they serve to bring us out of sin, if they serve to bring us out of idolatry, and, and we're not listening to his word, then it's a good thing. And uh, that's why our response when, it, when something like this happens shouldn't be merely to stand up and say, we're just going to bind all this. Now, as believers in Christ, I believe the judgments or chastenings or whatever you want to call them, plagues, famines, uh, natural disasters, when they come, uh, our first thought should be to submit to God, humble ourselves before Him, and, and see, Lord, is there anything in me that you want to change? So as we're submitted to God, then we can resist the devil. 
Boy, and if it's not the devil, if it's the Lord, he'll lift it off if we submit to God. So I think that's a healthier answer than just, we're just going to bind it. Now, the chastenings, the judgments of God, when they came in the days of, uh, Egypt, of when Israel was in bondage to Egypt, God made a distinction, a distinction between who was his people and who wasn't. And it's still the same today. In other words, uh, if we're walking with God, judgments are not for us if we're walking with God. If we're compromising or backslidden or God's, you know, wanting to take us through some things, but the, the shakings of the nations, like in Haggai 2, those are to wake up people that are not walking with God. So we see things that we call negative coming on the earth. We shouldn't fear. We should, in our, in our abiding in Christ, I'm pleading the blood of Jesus over my house. I declare no plague or come near my dwelling. But I don't believe that the church has the authority to just bind it off the nation. People have, there's, you got Egypt and Israel together. God wanted the plagues to come on Egypt. He wanted to break them. He wanted to show them that their gods are not God. He wanted to bring them to a place where they would maybe turn to him. But he does it. If we're already walking with God, we don't need it. Come on, somebody say amen. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. Here's what, how we respond to satanic uh, attacks. Romans 16, 19, and 20. I want you to be excellent in what is good and innocent concerning evil, and then the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. So we don't, we're not saying don't resist evil uh, if we discern that it's demonic, not to resist it, but our first reaction isn't to, to just bind it. It's to make sure I'm excellent in what is good, innocent in what is evil, and then the God of peace will crush Satan's head under our feet. Now, we talk about God working all things together for good with this coronavirus. I wonder how many families are spending time together that haven't before. I wonder. Someone made a funny post. They said, I wonder how many parents are finding out right now that it's not the teacher's fault. I, you know, these are good things. I wonder how many people right now who are not walking with God, and they should be, and they're backslidden, maybe even believers, and they're in turmoil about their finances. Maybe they need to uh, check up on themselves and seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness instead of put all their trust in money. You know, I wonder how many uh, people are being disrupted and there's good that comes out of it if it causes us to realign and, and to take another look at our walk with God. Another, uh, anyway, yes, ultimately God wants good. Ultimately, uh, but his highest goal is to conform us to Christ. I heard a story, I read a story of a man and a woman a long, long time ago they, a husband and wife, they loved each other very much. They were on one of those olden ships crossing the Mediterranean Sea and a great storm rose up and the waves mounted up and um, people on the ship were very fearful. The man's wife was very fearful. She cuddled next to him and he put his arm around her and she was just terrified and he seemed to be so calm. And he said to her, she said to him, aren't you afraid? He said, I trust the Lord. She said, but aren't you afraid of this storm? Aren't you afraid? And he pulled out his sword and he put it up to his wife's throat. He said, are you afraid? She said, no. He said, why? She said, because I know who's holding it. I know who's holding the sword. He said, he put the sword back in his sheath. He said, that's why I'm not afraid of the storm. I know whose I am, and I know who's holding it. Come on, somebody. So that's what, um, that's our posture. Is, uh, God does cause everything to work together for good. 
according to his purpose, which is to conform us to Christ. And I do believe, I brought a teaching three or four weeks ago right here from this pulpit, that the season that we're in right now is the season of Haggai chapter 2, where God's shaking the nations and preparing his church for glory. So for us, when we see these things, I think our prayer should be, uh, we should apply the blood of Jesus over our home and over our families. But then we ought to be about the Father's business as a house of prayer, praying for our cities, that, that people are being shaken, praying. And they're not just praying, but we need to stand in the gap and pray, but evangelizing. We need to be evangelizing, passing out tracts, talking to people, offering to comfort people, leading people to Christ. That's what we need to be doing about our Father's business. It's a... Uh, Anyway, another thing I want to address here uh, is that among those who, ha who take this posture, that there's no judgments today. All judgments are done on the cross. That is just so not true. And that embracing this dangerous false ideology leaves people unprepared for the difficulties coming. It also gives them the wrong posture because they'll see everything rather than the sovereign hand of God that's working things for good and discerning what we need to resist and what we need to flow with, everything negative is from the devil and we're going to bind it. Well, you can't bind the works of God. And those things may come to expose things in us that need to change. And so it's a really dangerous error to say that there's no judgment. In the New Testament, there's judgments. Ananias and Sapphira were judged and great fear came on all the church. And then the power of God kept on flowing. The fear of the Lord is clean, the Bible says. The fear of God resting on the New Testament church kept it holy. That's why the power kept flowing. And the Lord is jealous over his holy presence among his people. And that's why he stepped in and dealt with sin to keep the fear of God and the holiness. Because the holiness keeps the power flowing. And uh, you see, uh, Herod stood up and gave a great speech. And the people praised him. And they said, that's the voice of a God, not of a man. And he didn't give God the glory. The Bible said God sent an angel, struck him, and killed him. And he was eaten of worms. That's judgment in the New Testament. You can see it in the, in the, all the way through the book of Revelation, the judgments of God. So some are saying that anyone that would prophesy any kind of judgment, that that's fear-mongering, that's negativity, that's not of God. But that's not what the Bible says. In Acts chapter 11, verse 28, it says, Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up. One of them, it says there were prophets there. So prophet Agabus stood up and he showed by the Spirit there's going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Now, see, this was a prophet of God standing up to tell the church there's a famine coming. So what did they do? How did the apostles handle it then? Did they say, we're going to stop it? Did they have the authority to stop it? Here's what they did. They didn't act in fear. They didn't hoard. They said, then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. So rather than be self-centered and say, oh, a famine, there was no fear. A famine's coming. We know God's going to take care of us. Let's take an offering and send it to the brethren over there. So they moved in faith and believed in God's provision and they shared. So that, so to, sometimes when a word comes about something negative that's going to come, what we would call negative, we say it's not of God. This is my, I think this is my last point. So, uh, I want to talk about how our discernment gets off. Why do we say things that are of God or of the devil or, or of the devil or of God? How do we get it mixed up? And if we don't get it right, we can have the wrong response. Um, Jesus told his disciples that he was going to be turned over to the priests. He was going to be tortured and killed. When he told them that, Peter came to him probably pulled him aside and said, may it never be. And uh, Jesus rebuked Peter. He said, get behind me, Satan. Then he told Peter why his discernment was off. He said, you're judging according to man, 
but not according to God. You're looking at things through the lens of man, not according to God's lens. Now, John 10.10 says, The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I, Jesus, have come to give you life abundantly. Now, we can take that and you oversimplify it and look through the lens of man. Now, if I take John 10.10, 10, everything good is from God, everything bad is from the devil. If I do what Peter did and I start looking through man's lens, I now judge everything by how I think it's good. Does it benefit my flesh? Does it make me comfortable? Does it make me happy? Okay? If we judge good and evil, we're not eating from Jesus, the tree of life. To judge from man's point of view is from Jesus, the tree of life. There were two trees in the garden. One was the tree of life. One was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. When we eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's, it's deadly. So what we do is we say, oh, God wouldn't do that. That's not good, so it can't be God. But from God's point of view, what is good is anything that will bring us closer to Him. Anything that will get us out of the flesh life, out of self-centeredness, into trusting God, knowing Him, abiding in Him, that's good. And anything that, even if it's a blessing, it could be the material blessings I have. It could be my job. It could be this. If these things are keeping me from the life of Christ, the things we call good, God calls them bad. Because when we judge from God's point of view, it's whatever brings us into Christ. And if that means something uncomfortable for a season to get us into Christ, that's a good thing. And we see that in Psalm 107. Verses 21 to 31, I'll just paraphrase it for the sake of time. It says, Oh, that men would be, give praise to God for his wonderful works to the sons of men, for his goodness. That's what it says in Psalm 107, verse 21 to 31. This is the goodness of God and his wonderful works. It says, Men go down on the sea to do business in their ships. Then the Lord raises up the wind and the stormy sea, and the waves rise up to the heavens. And the men reel to and fro like drunken men in the storm on the ship. Then it says they come to their wit's end. Then they cry out to the Lord in their distress. Then the Bible says the Lord calms the storm and guides them to their desired haven. Oh, that men would give praise to God for his wonderful works to the children of men. Don't say that natural disasters and... That's what it says here. Other natural disasters... These occurrences are not judgments from God. It is a judgment sometimes from God. Sometimes it's a result of the earth reacting to our sins. It's nature reacting to the sin of man. But God will use these things and, uh, to bring us to our wit's end. As soon as the men got to their wit's end, that means we're out of resources. We're out of ideas. We have... Nothing to pull out of the bag to get ourselves out of this pinch. Then they cry to God. God said, that's where I wanted to get you. I wanted to get you off of self-reliance, ignoring God, independence. I want to get you to dependence on God. As soon as they cried out to God, God said, I don't need that storm anymore. He calmed the storm and brought them where they need to go. So he said, then after that, he says that men would give thanks to God for his goodness. Isaiah 26, 9, Chris referenced it. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. So that's, so everything works together for good. Now there are some storms that are just totally demonic. And that's where we need to walk with God and discern it and stand against it and stop it. One of those was when Jesus was crossing to where the demoniac of the Gadarenes was. Jesus said, let us go to the other side. He knew where he was going. He was on a mission to deliver a man from a legion of demons. A legion of demons is a lot. I don't know how many thousands. Some people say it's 6,000. Some say it's 7,200. That's a lot of demons in one man. He was so violently evil that they put him in chains and he broke them. And uh, oh, the compassion of God. A naked man 
out of his mind, demon-possessed in chains. And Jesus was sent on a mission to set him free. He got in a boat, went all the way across the sea for one man. Because his cries came up to God. And so, so there was a demonic storm. The, demo, the evil powers not wanting this man to be delivered. So not every storm. I'm not saying every storm is just from God. Let's lay back. We have to discern. We have to know when to say, God, I need to submit myself to you. And I need to ride through this and let you deal with me. Others, we need to submit ourselves to God and then just rebuke it. Anyway, the bottom line is this. God is good. He's working everything together for good. In Christ, we have authority. We should use it over our homes, over our families. We should, I believe with all my heart that the church needs to become the house of prayer. I'm talking about the church in general all over. Thank God we got a lot of praying people here and a lot of evangelizing people here. And, um, but I think that uh, when storms come, we need to check up on ourselves. Ask God to speak to our hearts and help all of us make the right alignments. And uh, no weapon formed against us can prosper. And let's be the light for the people in darkness, the people in fear. I will say this. Uh, I hadn't planned to say it, but I'm going to say it. I was with... Uh, Brother Sadhu in uh, India just a couple days ago. And um, he had received a revelation, an encounter, where the Lord had said to him that the year 2020 uh, was a year of preparation, of getting the fruit of the Spirit established in our hearts. That God's really wanting to get the church established in the fruit of the Spirit uh, because for what's coming, God wants to release his love, anointing, and power on us. And we have to have that foundation of the fruit of the Spirit. So he said this is a year of preparation, but in 20, the next year following 2020, 2021 from then on, there would be more disruptive things than this year all, all over the world. Now, I believe that word. I believe he's, the only one that, he's not the only one that's received words like that. It's, we're in the season of the shaking of the nations, the great end-time harvest, and the glory of God in the church. So God's preparing. While the, while the nations are shaking, he's preparing us for glory. So he, I said, he said, I saw disruptive things coming that are going to be more serious than this year. And I asked him specifically, I said, have you seen, as the Lord revealed you, specifically what some of those things are? He said, yes, one of them is a, another virus plague, but it'll be much more serious than this one. So I said, does he give you a timing? He said, no, he didn't show me a timing. All I know is it'll be sometime after this year. So it could be five or 10 years away. It could be 10, 12 months away. I don't know. But I thought it was interesting that um, when you read, and I'm not saying that the Lord is telling me this. I'm just telling you what I think is interesting when the Spanish flu came in 1918, it came over a two-year period in two waves. In the first six months, it was mild. And then they said it, they mutate, which viruses do. The first six months, it was mild, mutated. And the last, so the whole first year was kind of a flu, kind of disappeared. And a year later, it reemerged. Same Spanish flu, but it mutates. And when it did, when it came around the second time, it was serious. 500 million people in the world were infected. 10% died. 50 million people around the world died of the Spanish flu. I just thought of that because I was reading some historical things about it. I'm not saying God told me that's going to happen. I'm just thinking about it, of the possibilities of this could be a if this is a year of preparation, what we're going through right now could be just the grace of God to make us prepare. Now, I'm not afraid. We shouldn't be afraid of, the, of plagues because if we're walking with God, the judgments aren't for us. Everybody hear that? 
If we're walking with God, the judgments aren't for us. It's our opportunity to help people. It's, it's the storm that brings people to their wit's end so that they'll start crying on God. And we're to be there with open arms, with help, with prayer, with the gospel, with love, to, to reap the harvest. Hey, anything you want to add or take away to that, Chris? I'm, it's all going to work for good. It's all going to work for good. Put the blood of Jesus over your house. You know, I shared this t- uh, testimony of uh, six or eight weeks ago. I, a great testimony I saw on, on Sid Roth. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. A man, uh, an elderly man, he said his wife had a heart attack, a massive heart attack. And he, he said she just fell over unconscious and then died right in his house. And he said, I was, he, Sid Roth said, what did you do? He said, I, I laid her across my lap. He said, I cried. He said, I cried to the Lord, Lord, you can't take my wife yet. And um, he said, I've never in my life had an open vision before. He said, but right in front of me, a board appeared, an open vision. And it said, if you'll apply the blood to your house, the, the, the death angel will pass over. And he said, right then, I apply the blood of Jesus over my house. And she sat up. Come on. So we should apply the blood to our house. I'm not saying give in to disease. Oh, God wants me to be sick. I'm not saying that. I'm saying these things couldn't happen unless, even if it's of the devil, it couldn't happen unless the Lord allowed it. So he wants us to deal with it. Put the blood around our house. He wants us to evangelize. We should be bringing hope to people that are scared. But I, I just don't know. I'm not saying yes or no. I just, I just don't know if, if the church has the authority uh, to just stand up and say, we shut it all down. We're stopping the whole thing. It may be the Lord wants it to run its course so that people have their chance to start turning to him. And the church can be out in the streets laying hands on people and healing them. Anyway, praise God.